Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs unlocked success and how their stories can help you do the same. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason has built multi million dollar businesses that have been featured in Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. His life's mission now is helping entrepreneurs live what he calls hashtag the exit lifestyle. Introducing TEDx speaker, mastermind leader, author, entrepreneur, cigar aficionado, motorcycle enthusiast, and host of the root of all success, the real Jason Duncan. The real real Jason Jason Duncan. Duncan. All right. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Master Series. I am the real Jason Duncan. Thank you so much for joining me live today here on Zoom. And for those of you that aren't joining me live on Zoom, we're going to be watching this replay later. Thank you for taking the time to do the replay. It's going to be well worth your time because I have an amazing guest expert who's going to be sharing some great stuff about money today. And money makes the world go round. And the more you know about it, the more you can leverage it to benefit yourself benefit the community that you live in, and ultimately benefit the world by changing the world. And that's the way that we can do it. We can do it through money, but we got to understand how it works. So today's Entrepreneur Master Series is dedicated to that. And I'll do a more thorough introduction to the guest and the topic in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what the Entrepreneur Master Series is, because I know we got a lot of new people that are on this today. And I want to make sure that you understand what you are, what you've signed up for and what you're doing here. So the Entrepreneur Master Series, otherwise known as EMS, is a live 90-minute webinar series that I do a couple of times a month, just like what we're doing right now. And I bring in, uh, I do this to to provide high-value content to entrepreneurs all over the world. And I want it to be practical, I want it to be tactical, and I want it to be for entrepreneurs. And so what I'm doing is I bring in, on a regular basis, a top expert in some area. I want a, I want a, a subject matter expert in things like liter, financial literacy, which is what we're doing today, leadership, entrepreneurship, business ownership. Those are the types of things we're going to be talking about. And we're going to go into this as a masterclass on specific topics that'll help you be a better entrepreneur. We even released this as a special episode on my podcast, The Root of All Success. So if you're listening to this on my podcast later, thank you so much for doing that. All these episodes are recorded live on Zoom, and we have, you know, a various number of people that join us live, and then a lot of people watch the replay afterwards. So thank you, no matter how you're engaging with this today. I want to thank you for doing that. Um, I want to go ahead and talk about the topic and introduce the guest. She's going to come on here just a second, turn her video on just a moment. But I want to introduce who our guest is for today. So I've got with me today, Dr. Amanda Barrientes, and she is known as the Money Healer. And she's also the founder of a, a business called NFA, which stands for No Effing Around. <laughs> and it's all about money. She's a, a business consultant. She helps coaches and online entrepreneurs heal their relationship to money so they can work less, make more, and have fun on their business building that journey. Now, for those of you that follow me on a regular basis, you know that's kind of my thing too, work less, make more, live the exit lifestyle. And so today's guest is going to actually help us figure out how to do that from a financial literacy perspective. Dr. Amanda, after going from food stamps to building a six-figure business pretty fast, she's been on a quest to teach entrepreneurs how to make more money doing exactly what they love to do. And what we're going to be talking about today are the top three money blocks that are preventing you from making money. So before I get into any more of that, I want you to help me welcome Dr. Amanda Barrientes to the show. Amanda, good to see you. Woo-hoo. We need some party music. Yeah, we need to go back. I need to get some other bumper music. So when I hit the when you hit the yeah. video, it's like boom. It's like the drum roll. Because <laughs> hey, if you're you listening want? to this in the car, you know, on the on the podcast version of it, you don't really get the same uh the same effect. But you know, yeah. it's good to see you again. We 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 you and I were introduced through I guess mutual marketing connections about podcasting. And uh you invited me to be on your show. You came on my show, this podcast. And then when I was looking for a guest expert around financial literacy, I thought no further than you. It's like, hey, she's uh, not effing around about this money stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, I love it. I love to be here. Master classes to me are one of the most fun things that you can do because they get to be interactive and we get to do a real deep dive. So it'll be fun. Yeah, it is going to be fun. We're going to have a good time today. So this topic that we're going to be talking about today um, is, is all really about mindset, the top three money blocks that keep you from making money. And, um, you know, I had a mentor of mine tell me, gosh, it was a couple of years ago. And it was the first time it had ever, it had ever occurred to me that what he said was true, of course, but it had never occurred to me before, but he was like, hey, some people are good at baseball. Some people are good at art. Some people are good at music. Some people are good at cooking. Uh, and some people are really good at money. And, and, and the converse to all that is true that some people are not good at baseball or art or music or money. But I find that money, even though there are levels of being good at it, uh, some people make money anytime they do anything and others struggle through it. Uh, but it's still really a mindset more than just about anything else, because it's not like playing the guitar. It's not a skill that you learn specifically. It's about how you mentally work through that. Is that the way you see this as a mindset issue? Uh, you said so many things we could talk about for nine, all 90 minutes. <laughs> um, you know, I would say yes and no, I, because I do think it is a skill that anyone can learn. I think the desire to learn that skill is going to be mindset based. And I think that when people are kind of, you know, quote unquote, born good at it, it's because they were born into a family or a, or, or a culture or a situation where they got to develop wealth consciousness in a different way. And I'd say that most people don't experience that, unfortunately, you know, it's it, one of those things that we think we should be good at. And as adults, when we're not good at it, we don't realize, oh, it can be a skill that you learn and that you can feel good about making money. And so I, I've yet to meet a person who doesn't have some version of the money blocks we'll talk about today, whether they're making five bucks an hour, millions of dollars an hour, um, depending on how they make their money. You know, money is one of those things that cuts across all people all races, all classes, all genders. And it just is something that we have so much charge about. You know, we can feel shame and fear and anxiety and embarrassment or infatuation, elation, excitement, jealousy, resentment. I mean, money brings up pretty much everything. And so to me, it's why it's that core part of you that that you can feel good or bad about. And I love to help people feel good about it, no matter how they're making it or what, you know, how they're spending, earning, investing, growing it, all of those things. You know, this, uh, this show is really about being very practical and tactical, getting into the topic. And we're going to definitely do that. But I want to take just a couple of minutes here at the beginning to give our listeners, people that are participating in this live and the folks who are listening to it after the fact, just a snippet of your story because you now we told we told your story and you talked a lot about your story on my podcast so i would encourage people to go back go to the root of all success.com scroll down find where dr dr amanda barrientes was on the show and we did a whole hour or so show on her story how she went from food stamps to building this amazing six-figure business where she's helping entrepreneurs all over the world do their money money better but just give us a little brief you know couple minutes on your story and then we'll dive into the tactics yeah you know for me it started being really bad with money <laughs> and really not skilled in both relationships and money and what that was rooted in was my sense of self and so you know the very first version of my business was I, I helped people focus on personal power win-win relationships and money mastery those were the three pillars and they still are the three pillars that I see that you've got to master if you want to have what I call a magic wand life where you get to work less make more and have fun what that means is you get to go like, oh my God, I feel like I have a magic wand. I can be, do, and have whatever I choose to create. And that's what this work has led me to. And it really started with me crying on the floor one night. I was looking out at this empty basement because my boyfriend had just moved out. I had met him through leaving my 15 year marriage, having an affair. And of course this relationship wasn't working out because I was really lacking relationship skills. And so I'm sitting there crying, looking at this empty basement, trying to find a house for me and my three kids to live in when I'm on a grad school income. I couldn't find anything that I could afford. I was already on food stamps and I, I was just sitting there really feeling sorry for myself. And like in this place of going, I don't know what to do. No one's coming to save me. I'm terrified. I feel, I mean, I went to bed crying pretty much every night and money was on my mind all the time. And my bad relationships were on my mind a lot because I felt really alone. And so 
you know, I had this moment where I sat up and I was scanning my life course and I had this thought, I'm the common denominator. Like this is me. <laughs> it's not <laughs> no. you. It's me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like it was like, Oh crap. I'm the person that needs to change. And before that point, I'd really blamed everyone else, like my parents and my upbringing and all the things, my ex-husband, like all of it. And so I had this moment, like I got to do something different. And in that moment, I dedicated my life really to going, I want to learn how to master the art of relationships and money and myself. And I started listening to podcasts and that led me down this whole amazing road of understanding that we can change and learn and grow. And that most people don't have these skills. They, they're not something that we're taught in school. If you don't get in in your families, where are you going to learn how to have great relationships? And those are things that really cause you to thrive. Like if you're struggling with money, you're going to have a hard life. If you're struggling in relationships, life is going to kind of suck. And I also knew as a sociologist that when we have those things in tune and we have high quality relationships and we're making money doing what we love, then we feel a lot better and our longevity increases and we get to kind of wake up every day and feel like, okay, awesome. It's great to be alive. And I wanted to feel those things. And so as I started implementing what I was learning, everything started to change. And I decided I want to teach the world these skills that I'm learning. And so I took the leap into becoming a coach and I went six figures in that first year. Wow. So isn't it interesting that like most people who are, are really good at some sort of life skill usually sucked at it at the beginning, like they were really, really bad. So if there's a relationship coach, it's probably because they had terrible relationships. If there's a, um, you know, like you're, you're talking about money now. I mean, you're, you're really bad at it before. Um, why do you why do you think most people are bad with money? Is there a general reason for that? Or, or what do you think? Absolutely. I think that it has to do, and this isn't to blame our parents. It's just to recognize where the issues come from. When we're born, we have from ages zero to seven, we're like sponges who absorb everything and it gets stored in our subconscious and we have no filtration system or no way to go, oh, I choose to believe that and not this. And so we just take in everything that we're learning. And, you know, so we're learning through seeing people, uh, movies and preachers and teachers and siblings and anyone who who's hanging out in our surroundings, we're just absorbing everything we're learning. And so that is what gets stored. That is what starts to create our money beliefs. And so if you were born into a house, let's say they talked about money in really powerful ways and they had high financial literacy and, you know, like FQ that was stellar and they felt really good about it. And you watched the people making money, doing what they enjoyed and there wasn't stress around it. And, you know, it's kind of like this picture, perfect money utopia, <laughs> then you're going to have really high wealth consciousness automatically, because those are the beliefs that will have gotten embedded into your belief system. Most of us don't have that. You know, most people, most children watch families struggle, stress, fight. It's one of the top things that families fight about. And it's one of the highest, you know, one of the biggest reasons people get divorced and it causes a lot of stress. And so most kids get these, I call them money OS, money operating system downloads, where they start to believe things that aren't actually true, but they just take it as truth. And then when we take something as truth in our subconscious, we will look to our surroundings and re create that story over and over again. And so it reinforces the belief and it's like neural wiring in your brain that gets embedded with deeper and deeper paths of, of neural wiring. And so you've got to actually start to get conscious to change those money beliefs. So you use that word conscious again, and you said it earlier, you said wealth consciousness. I actually wrote that down. I'm not taking notes and I would encourage all the listeners to do the same thing. I want to get into that deeper, but before we do, I want to set a couple of things up. So for the listeners out there, you can participate in this. So there is a, uh, there is a question and a bubble in your Zoom if you're on a computer. Now, if you're on a phone, it's a little harder to do that, but you still can do it. But go to the Q&A bubble and that will pop up and it'll let you ask a question both uh, Amanda and I will see those questions and we can answer them live here. You're, you don't have to come on camera. You're not coming on the microphone. You just type your question in and we'll try to answer that. And we, you can do that at any time throughout the show today. Leave that. Plus, if you want to get into the chat, just make sure you're on the everyone. Not uh, You can do chat to everybody. If you got a comment you want to just send to the two of us, you can do hosts and panelists and send us a chat. And our last EMS that we did, uh, a few, actually, I did it last month. I usually do two a month. This is the only one I'm doing this month because of summer schedules and whatnot. But we had a very active chat room and people were making, it was a lot of fun to watch it happen. So feel free to chat 
and uh, just if you got questions, put them in there. So let's uh, let's look at this. So today, Amanda, we're going to be talking about these top three money blocks. And what I heard you say in all of that really is what this boils down to is that we've got bad money stories. Like our story, the story we believe about money that we were taught by our parents, our churches, our schools, um, for the most part, most of us, I'd say 99, 95, 99% of us have a bad story about what money is. I know that I had one. I, I was taught not consciously, and I don't even know if it was something that they were aware of, but I think my parents and my church growing up taught me that rich people probably did something bad or illegal, or they were just not good people to get there. Rich people were always looked at with this skepticism. And then and then on the converse, the, the people who were poor, well, obviously they didn't do something right. And that now I know is not true. Like that is not true at all. But that is a story that was ingrained that money. I love how you said the money OS, money operating system. That was the operating system that was that uh, that uh, that I got grown up. So when somebody says the chat's disabled, all right, let me enable that while Amanda's answering that question. So tell us about a little a little bit about the whole idea behind a money story. Yeah. Yes. Great. Great questions. And and let's talk about that and what money blocks mean, because let's start to pick apart our money story. I think for everybody here who's listening, watching live time or later, you can start to piece together your money story first, just by asking yourself what your first money memory is. And so go back to a time you remember something that happened with money. It could be something you were watching or experiencing a movie. It could be a, something going on with your parents. And just remember, like, what was this thing that happened with money where you started to kind of get consciousness about money? And it could have been, you know, I'll give everyone an example. When I was, I think I was about five or six and I wrote this up in my money story. I have all of my clients write a full money story. And this is how I came up with the money blocks profile and came up with these top money blocks because I saw such consistent patterns with people and, and breaking down and getting conscious of your money story is what helps you be able to transform it. So in my money story, my first money memory was, I remember it so vividly. I, I think I was about five or six. And we were out at this dinner with a whole bunch of friends from church. I, I was raised as a fundamentalist Christian. And there were a whole bunch of people. And I remember like stress about the bill. And I was, I could feel it. And I was really sensitive and very empathic. And I remember being like, people are stressed. What's going on here? And, you know, they were passing the check around. And I didn't know, I was a little kid. I didn't know that like, when you wrote a check, you had to have money to back up the check. <laughs> you know, so I said, well, why do, like, why don't you just write a check? You know, like I could tell everyone was stressed and I wanted to like solve the problem. And I was like, why don't you just write a check? And my mom and dad and everyone at the table laughed at me. Like they thought it was cute, of course. And I felt just intense shame. And I couldn't have remembered, you know, when I remember this story, it wasn't like I was sitting there going like, I feel ashamed and go under the table. But I remember feeling really embarrassed. My face turned red and I hid under the table for the rest of the night. And so when I rewrote my money story, how that played out is I have people pick apart and go like, what did that start to have you potentially believe? And just start brainstorming. So for everyone here, you know, think what was the, one of the first money memories that I can remember and what did it have me believe? So for me, what that started to have me believe is don't, don't speak up about money. You're not smart about money. People will laugh at you if you make suggestions that aren't right. And so it happened this like, shame and embarrassment around money. Like you're, I'm stupid. And so, you know, I, I, in that moment, it caused me to start to create that belief and play that out in my life in repetitive ways where when I didn't understand something that was going on with money, instead of asking or recommending something, I would just be quiet. And we all know that anytime you're quiet about something, you, it's not easy to learn. And so it caused me to hide what I didn't know about money, which meant that I couldn't, you know, save, invest and grow my wealth starting at a young age. That's funny because I think all of us as kids or most of us as kids can probably remember a very, very similar episode where we were like, we'll just write a check. And for today's yeah. kids, it might be, we'll just pull the card out, just swipe the yeah. card, right? That works, doesn't it? Yeah. And we, <clears throat> and as a kid, you don't, you don't, you don't understand the mechanics of how checks right. or credit cards work or, you know, I think my kids are 22 and 19 and I can, I remember at one point, my daughter, <laughs> my daughter was saying something about, well, can't you just go to the bank and get more? Like, it was just yeah. like, you're like, it's that's what the bank you. does. It has the money. You just go get some, right? <laughs> totally. 
So right, wow. and it's such an it's such an innocent thing. And and I think of it now, it's like it could have been a great teaching moment. Oh, that that makes sense. You would think that, and you just explain it, and then I would have been like, oh. Instead, for me, like shame and guilt was a big thing, just kind of the way I was raised in fundamentalist Christianity, the way that it was taught to me. There was a lot of shame and, and embarrassment and guilt and things like that, and so I just felt shame, like oh my god, I'm stupid, and so. Uh, you know, as parents here, anyone who's a parent listening, just remember when your kids are asking questions about money, teach them, you know, when they're coming up with grandiose thoughts, teach them. These are all teachable moments because we are training our kids to feel and be a certain way about money. And we are, we can retrain ourselves to feel and be a certain way about money. And so I, you know, I love to choose to empower beliefs and have people being curious and playful with money instead of feeling like, oh no, I'm dumb for not knowing this. And I think it's amazing to me how many adults I work with who they don't know how to invest and they feel bad asking because no one ever taught them and they feel embarrassed that they don't know. And then we go like, Hey, let's teach people how to have their money, make money for them in ways that feel fun and aligned. And like, let's raise the consciousness of our money story so that we can rewrite it at any time and choose what we want to create. So one of the things I know that you do is you work and coach entrepreneurs and online business business owners to re- literally rewrite a money story. And I know that there's going to, you're going to be able to offer people the opportunity to work with you to do that at the end. But what what does that mean? Like, are you literally having somebody write down and say, okay, write this and then write that? Is that what you're, is that what you mean by rewriting it's a, it's your story? That's a great question. So I have them write a money story first. So that's going to be like a retrospective looking back at your history. So you're going to look at all the verbal things that you were directly told, the things you experienced and what you started to just see and experience and believe about money. And this could be like, you know, my parents would often say money is the root of all evil, like straight out. That was like a direct direct lesson I got, which caused me to be like, oh no, it just like you were saying, you know, people who have a lot of money are somehow bad. It's wrong to have a lot of money. And yeah. so, you know, we pick that apart. So we do an actual money story. And then what we start to do is reframe the beliefs through written practices and thinking about, okay, if it, if it means this to me, what do I choose to have it believe? And then there's various ways that we rewrite it. So it could be like a literal rewriting as a version of the practice, but it is also doing things in the world as a practice, because the more that we practice in action, these new things, the more that we start to have different opportunities to see things in a different way. So we're always looking for evidence to counter those negative beliefs we have about money and create new neural pathways to reprogram our money mindset in a different way. So, so an actual rewriting could happen along with new actions that you take to rewrite your money story and you know, rewire it, your brain. You know, you, you've mentioned neuro, neuro programming, you know, NLP is one thing that a lot of people talk about neuro linguistic programming and uh, neuroplasticity and how our brains are, are, you know, can, can be molded to believe or act certain ways. Yeah. And, you know, you think about the really negative, I mean, really bad stuff, like with cults, you know, girls who are, who are brought up in, in a cult where part of the religion is they got to have sex with older men or marry the founder or something like that. Something nutty. Like my, yeah. my wife watches these crazy shows on television. I don't watch them, <laughs> but I hear enough about it from the background. I'm like, that's crazy. Why does anybody do that? And it's because they were programmed that way. They were programmed to think a certain way. And for them, it was completely normal. Yeah. It's completely normal to, to do those, what we would consider to be reprehensible, terrible things, but they were just programmed. Now that's a really, uh, crazy hyperbolic answer or, or example, but money is the same way, right? I mean, our, we're taught a certain thing about money that, you know, we, we always hear the people that grew up during the depression era that they're, they're pack rats and savers. They don't want to spend. They want to keep, 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 because their brain was, was programmed to think if I spend this, I'd never get it back yeah. where today's society, today's, you know, our, our generations, generation X and uh, millennials and Z's, we don't have that same idea. It's like money is this weird thing. We're not even on the gold standard anymore. So it's just printed money that we can do. It's kind of like writing a check, you know, we just, whatever, you just write the check. So yeah. let's get into these blocks because if we can't make money, if we're having problems with it, there's got to be some blocks. And that, that's what we're going to talk about today. The top three blocks. I'm sure there are more than three, but how would you, how would you introduce this subject to get us into the meat of that? And before you answer that, I want to remind everybody, Go to the Q&A bubble to ask your questions. And if you've got comments or things, you can put them in the chat. 
but try not to answer ask questions in the chat because we might not see the question yeah i'm seeing so the there, chat are, area. There, there are a few coming in um, yeah so go it, to yeah. the q a and ask, ask your questions and this is for all the people watching doing the replay or listening to this on the podcast this is why you need to be here live so you can ask questions live yes. so amanda what do you think like how would you introduce the idea of the money blocks and then yeah. how do get Ooh, I can't three. wait first okay, I want to answer because Denise Richards uh shared her first money memory so I just want to share with everyone so they can start to trigger their thoughts around it um she said I remember getting in trouble for asking a neighbor for a nickel you could get a lot for a nickel back then my mom was embarrassed ashamed and got so upset with me I learned never to ask for or expect much after that I felt shame for wanting money so we can all see how powerful that is thank you for sharing Denise you know it's it's wild to think how impactful one look, one comment, one experience can be and how that moment can cause you as an adult to not ask for what you want, right? So what happens is we start to create these limiting beliefs around money where we go, oh, it's not, it will make my mom unhappy if I ask for money. It then translates into when you're having a, let's say a coaching consult and you go, oh, selling is bad because I'm asking people for money. And that's so deeply rooted that then you feel bad charging for what you're worth. You'd feel bad creating packages and up-leveling your programs. And, and most people don't know, they have no connection in their brain that, oh, I'm having a hard time selling in my business because of this memory of asking for a nickel when I was a kid. They, you would not automatically make that connection. And that's why this work is so powerful because once you clear that out and you start to heal your relationship to more money and transform and become aware, you're like, oh, okay, I can, it's almost like excavating. You know, I think of it as like excavating for those memories and you're going to remove that memory and, and take it out and look at it for what it really is so that you don't have to keep recreating that story and reinforcing these money blocks that we'll talk about. So that, that you know, I want, I want everyone here. Thank you, Denise, for sharing, because it's helpful when people start to understand like, oh, how, what did that cause me to believe right now? Um, do you, uh, a question for you, Jason, someone else did ask a question in the, yeah, we've no. got a question about good and bad debt, which may yeah. be a little advanced for where we are in the conversation. I'm sure we're going to get to that. So if we, unless you want to address it now, we can hold that to later. How about this? I'll apply it to a money block belief as yeah. we go through. So yeah, I think, I don't know if the name is Russell, M. Russell. We will we'll go through that when as we walk through money blocks. Good. Um, so, and definitely everyone asks questions. It's really fun to be interactive. I, I love interaction. It helps everyone experience more when, when you participate. So don't, don't be afraid to participate. Um, okay. So the three money blocks. So the way that I developed these three money blocks is like I said, every entrepreneur that I would work with, I started to have do money stories. And the reason for that is because when I was on food stamps and I started thinking, Ooh, I'd like to start a coaching business. I was still in grad school. And so I didn't have a ton of time, but I wanted to build a wealth building group. So I got some of my friends who I met at this awesome workshop together because we all lived in the same place. And I said, let's do a wealth building group and let's just get together and start talking about building our wealth. And I was reading avidly and I was really, it was like my highest value. I was like, I've got to learn how to build my wealth. I've got to get off of food stamps. I've got to change my life. And so one of the things that I started to see in the, you know, I was reading several different money books and I started to see this idea and concept of money stories in a lot of different money books that I was reading. A lot of it was like money mindset books. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to create like a, a way to write a money story. And so I wrote mine and it was like five or six, like fully typed pages, like really in depth. And then I had everyone in my wealth building group write this story. And in the group, I, I mean, it was so amazing to just watch people massively transforming and having it be such an impactful experience. So we all wrote it, we shared it with each other and we read them and then we talked about them. And at the time I didn't know nearly as much as I know now about all the unconscious stuff that was going on. And yet I could see it affecting people in a really powerful way. And so, you know, then I started having all my clients that once I started working I, with people, I thought, you know, I'm going to have people write a money story. And so every client I had would write a money story and we would go through their money story as one of the ways that I would help them get unstuck and empower themselves. 
And I just started to see these patterns. It didn't matter how much they were making or what business they had, or even what we were working on. It, I, I saw some really consistent patterns and I, I started, you know, I'm a sociologist and, and in sociology, you learn a lot about systems and patterns. And so yeah, that's what my PhD is. In. And so I started to see these patterns and thinking, okay, well, how can I create a way for people to uncover their unique money block? And so I started to piece them together and write down all the common beliefs that people were having and what I discovered is that there were three that were very common among everybody. And under these three, I, I think about them a lot. Like, you know, Bob Proctor talks about paradigms and these three are like paradigm beliefs. And underneath them, there's going to be thousands of different thoughts and beliefs that those paradigm beliefs have. So the top three, let's start there and we'll break them down. The first one is that money is bad. So that's going to be a, a, one of them overriding money blocks. The second is that money is scarce. And the third is that money causes stress. And so when you have these, let me give examples of each. So the money is bad is often going to come from, I've noticed a pretty big correlation with people who've come from religious backgrounds where they were told something directly like I was like money is the root of all evil. Or, um, you know, it might be this thing of like, oh, it's not spiritual to make money you know, I shouldn't charge for this because it's my God-given gift. Those kinds of things will come up for people who have this belief that money is bad. And it's interesting because even if you don't have a religious background, it might be that you have the belief that if I am wealthy, there's not going to be enough for the other people who are marginalized. So you feel guilty being wealthy because you think that somehow there's not enough to go around, which is also mixed with a money is scarce money block. But we could go, you know, like money is somehow bad. I might become a greedy jerk if I become too wealthy. What if people think that I'm, I'm selfish and I'm doing something wrong? What if I, what if you might have the belief I become a crook or a criminal? Like what if I'm a jerk when I get wealthy? because you think other people are that way. And so you're projecting your beliefs and then you will unconsciously create it and, and we'll dig into all that even more. But, you know, so we go, money is bad. So you're going to have, if you're an entrepreneur, what's going to happen when you have this belief is that you're going to undercharge and over deliver because you feel guilt and shame around money. So you're often going to have a hard time charging. You're not going to charge enough. You're going to work really hard. You're going to be very service-minded and heart-centered, and you're going to feel guilt and shame and embarrassment around being too wealthy. This is a lot of the time where people have what's called wealth shame, where they're really, really mega wealthy, but they hide how wealthy they are because they're afraid other people will judge them because they have that unconscious belief that money is somehow bad. You know, the the part about money is the root of all evil, I think from a religious perspective, because I grew up, uh, I follow Jesus, or I grew up in a Jesus following home all my life. So I, I had heard that, but I also know that that is not the correct quote. It's the yeah. love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So so there's there it's misquoted, but that doesn't that doesn't diminish the reality that you and I are dealing with as coaches and as leaders in society to say people think money is bad because they think it's the root of all evil. And I, I, I like how you um, talked about the threat of greed, because that that was part of my money story is that if I had too much, then I would become greedy. And I remember one time, this is part of my money story. And I got to keep, I got to make sure I don't give away people because I don't want to, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But I remember having a conversation with somebody, this was seven, eight, 10 years ago about another person who was wealthy. Um, and, and as it turns out now, they weren't as wealthy as I might've thought, but they were still wealthy. They had, they had money. And that this person I'm having this conversation with, I just mentioned a couple of things about his wealth, just indicators of wealth, like a, a house or a car. And I wasn't even trying to talk about how wealthy he was, just that he had those things. And this person responds with, well, I, mean, I don't remember what he said, but it was like, well, that he's obviously not a very good Christian. That was kind of the idea. And, I'm, I'm thinking, and I remember that was the first time in my life anybody ever said that to me. And I went, really? Like based on the fact that he has a house at that location? Well, you know, you're not supposed to have. And then this whole idea that we're supposed to be in living in poverty if we follow Jesus. And I'm sure Christianity is not the only religion that has some sort of Hinduism or Buddhism probably has the same kind of ideas that you got to be an aesthetic. You got to be a poverty mentality. You got to be like Mother Teresa and own nothing if you want to do do good. So I think that thread of greed and the misquoting of scripture root being at the root of all evil 
but I love, here's what you said. You said this, you said it leads to undercharging and over delivering. And a lot of coaches and business people right now, listening to this, like that's got to hit close to home. Like your bad money story about it being bad is that uh, that's why you don't charge enough for your coaching services <laughs> or yeah. whatever you're delivering. I, I happen to be a coach. That's why I said that, but yeah, I, see I love that. I love that, Amanda. Yeah. I, I, I want to dig here for a second. You know, I, I, I appreciate you saying that because the, the, you know, it's the love of money is the root of all evil. It's interesting because I also tell people that to start playing with the mantra, I love money and money loves me. And this is the thing, like when we, there's nothing wrong with loving money. It's, it's what we do with our money that matters, right? Like I like for people to know the more money you have, the bigger of an impact you can make. And I know because I've been stuck in survival mode and impoverished, all I thought about all day was money. Mark Twain says, it's not the root of, uh, it's not money is the root of all evil. It's poverty is the root of all evil, right? And we think about when people are impoverished, that's, that's war. I mean, we will do a lot to survive. And so when we're in an impoverished state, it's actually, if you think about money as like, uh, let's say when people are out of balance in their mental health, we say that they have a mental illness. When people are out of balance in their physical health, somehow they have a physical ailment. When we're out of balance with our money, why don't we think the same thing? Like it's actually a, a state that's not healthy for us to be impoverished. And in reality, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that you don't believe it's possible for you because there's great abundance that we can all have access to. And so it's shifting your money mindset into that wealth consciousness and going like, Hey, there's nothing wrong with having money. And in fact, you know, I think it's interesting if we go back to like biblical and we don't need to get like real crazy religious here, but you know, I was, a, because I was raised as a fundamentalist Christian, I'm not, I, I'm not like a practicing Christian anymore. I'm spiritual, but I teach like a lot of wealth consciousness and, and quantum physics and things like that. And it, to me, we are born abundant and we all deserve abundance and let's all play in the field of abundance and let's let everybody else and help everyone else up level. And it's impossible to do that when you're in a financially impoverished state because all you're focused on is survival. And so it's actually the most empowering thing you can do to not be impoverished. Right. And so that's how I think that as like the spiritual quest, like business building is a spiritual quest to make a larger impact in the world. And we can go like, yeah, money is an incredible tool to help the world transform. Agreed hundred percent. And I, I do think the poverty mindset is something that is uh, so much evil comes from that yeah. and without getting too political. I think that's where the social justice warriors get there because there's this poverty mindset that pervades all that. And that yeah. they're, they're seeking to overcome it in a way that's not realistic. And it causes so many terrible things. Now that's not, to, that also doesn't mean it, it's not binary one or the other. It also doesn't mean that just because someone has a lot of money, they're all, they're, they're all no. always altruistic and they're good. No, no there's, there <laughs> are, there are, there are crazy, yeah. terrible people on both ends of the spectrum. But I think that this love of money, you know, when 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 that was written in the scripture, it wasn't just saying I love money because I, I agree. I love money because I think that's where the world can be changed. I think generational wealth is an aspiration that we should that we should have because that's where where change is going to be made. And I think thinking that it's bad prevents us from doing great things. But when the scripture writes the love of money, it's talking about something different than what you mean when you say, I love money, money yeah. loves me. Because yeah. I'm certainly not disagreeing with you. And, yeah. and I don't think you disagree with me. I think that this idea of thinking that money is bad, or we got to keep it at arm's length. We only need enough. I hate the word enough when it talks, when we talk about money, like, enough, what does that even mean? Like, yeah. what, what does that mean? Enough for what? Enough for you, enough for your wife, enough for your husband, enough for your kids. Yeah. Like enough for what? What does that even mean? So I love that what we're talking about here, that one of the blocks that we have to keep us from making money is that money is bad. Now, we got a couple of people that made a couple of comments there. There, uh, you know, somebody said, you. I'll let you do it because I'll let you comment through the comments. Yeah, there. yeah. Okay, so I see. I don't know the name, so I'm just going to, uh, I yeah, I'm not sure whose name this is, but she, I think she, single mom, yeah. Okay, so she says, I had a hard time with money growing up it was hard to come by with my single mom. Oh, with my single mom. Okay. Then seeing my dad having it all, even though it was all through debt, I understand money flows now and I'm trying to figure out how to get close to it or in the stream of that flow. That's awesome. And good for you for being on that quest. 
Um, this is interesting because, you know, when I have people write money stories, one of the examples I use is having parents, like say they were just divorced and you see like vastly different realities in two different households and how much conflict that creates in your money story. Because, you know, and often it's like single mom, dad, is, you know, dad's doing well, mom's not. And that creates money. Like, let's say you're a girl and you're growing up watching your mom be struggle and your dad be successful as a girl, you're going to believe like women are disempowered financially. Mm -hmm. Men have all the money power, which that story gets recreated in a patriarchal system over and over and over again. Right. So good for you for digging into these things, you know, whatever gender you are or whatever, you know, you're doing in the world, it's really important to start to see like, oh, okay, money can flow. It doesn't matter who I am or what my past is, Adam. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, at, for Adam, you know, whatever those money stories started to download into you, start to play with it. And, and I, I'm glad that you're, you're playing, you, you know, I, I never use the word trying. So it's, so you said, I'm, I'm, I understand money flows now and I'm trying to figure out how to get close to it. So reframe that to, I am dedicated to, because when we talk about tr the word trying, we're struggling and we're, we're recreating the struggle in our minds. So just drop the word trying and instead say, I am dedicated. I'm committed to, I've decided that I'm figuring out how to be a money master, how to get into the flow and the stream, that kind of thing. And then uh, Denise says, um, right on to target coaches. Woohoo! Denise is an <laughs> awesome coach. She's a, she's amazing transformational coach. Um, poverty is a learned mindset. Yes. It, I mean, that could be the key takeaway for everyone here today. Poverty is a learned mindset. Wealth is a learned mindset and we can all change from wherever we're at right now, which is, I think, incredibly awesome to know. It's good stuff. So you said money is bad is one of our three money blocks. The top one thinking that it's bad. Um, but one before, before we go into the second one, money is scarce. Um, I want to talk about, and this might be a good segue to move into that. Cause you said that this particular thing also isn't scarce is that money is a zero sum game. Meaning if you have it, somebody else doesn't have it. And I actually heard somebody say this at a conference, not too long ago, they were talking about how that, that it was, that money was a, a zero sum game and that, yeah, if I had it, somebody else didn't. And they weren't coming at it from a poverty mindset, which was what surprised me because a lot of times when I hear that it's coming from the poverty mindset. It's like, well, just if you have, if you drive a Corvette or a Ferrari, that means somebody else can't have something. And I think that's hogwash. I think that's ridiculous. But where does that come from? Why do we think money is a zero sum game? Meaning if I have one and you have, if there's only two to be had, I have two, then you have zero. That's what that means. And why do people believe that? Yeah, I, I, it's perfect that you said this as a segue to money is scarce because I a lot of these three will overlap. You might have all three. You might have overlaps of two. You might have one at certain stage in your life and then another one at a different stage. And it just keeps going and going, right? And so um, it, this would really be money is scarce because when we have a scarcity mindset, we think either or not both and. So in a scarcity mindset of either or, either it's I'm wealthy, someone else is not, it can't be that we're both wealthy. And so when we think about that particular example from the money is bad, it, that's more going to be about the guilt and shame you feel around it. Like I feel bad for the people who are suffering. So if I suffer too, then it's okay. So that would be more in the money is bad money block. Whereas if you're thinking, well, if I'm rich, someone else has to be poor, that's money is scarce and, yep. and they could be combined. Um, another thing you said that I'm glad you reminded me of this. I wanted to remind everyone, money is an amplifier. That's all it is. So if you're a horrible, mean person and you get a lot of money, you're probably going to be more of a horrible, mean person. <laughs> if you're an awesome person who cares about making a difference in the world and you get more money, then you're just going to enhance that way of being. So it's not that money somehow changes you into a completely different person. It's that whatever, wherever you are and whoever you are, you're just going to be enhanced. And it's going to just help you amplify your impact. And so I really like to help people know that instead of money is bad, we go, oh, money creates freedom. Money gives people opportunities. Money liberates people. Money helps people grow. Money is abundance. Like we want to start seeing that money from a very different perspective instead of thinking it's bad or scarce. And so, so this is perfect to segue into money is scarce. So money is scarce. Money block is a really interesting one. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you'll, you'll know you have this one if you're working hard in your business 
and, or on your business. And you always think there's never going to be enough, no matter how much you make. And I see this all the time. So it could be people who are making, barely getting by. It could be people I've worked with, a woman who made millions. She, she kept hitting her money set point when she, you know, she kept saying, I'll quit doing my business. She didn't like it. This is before I met her. When I get to 20 million, that was her marker. Like I will build my business until it's to 20 million and then I'll sell it instead of, you know, selling it where it was at, which was at 13 million when I met her. So she would, what she would do is she'd build it up, build it up, build it up. It'd get to 20 and then she'd somehow sabotage like right before she'd get to 20 when she said she would sell it. And then she'd sabotage and bring it back down to like around 13. She just happened to her several times before I met her. And then we started working on money blocks and it was this, you know, partly that's that belief is like, there's never going to be enough and I can't do what I love to do. That's a real scarcity consciousness thought, right? Clearly a super powerhouse woman investor, founder of a 13 to $20 million company. That's awesome. That <laughs> and awesome. yet there was this belief of like, it's not, ne there's never going to be enough. What if I can't create a new business that's as, as successful? So we're going to have this belief, like I got to work really, really hard. There's never going to be enough no matter how much I'm making. And often this one will come from kids watching their parents work hard and really, and, and this could be money causes stress as well. But when we go money is scarce, like let, let's say it would be parents who worked hard, but didn't have time for you. Okay. So let's say you had parents that worked hard and maybe they made a lot of money, but they weren't around a lot. You might have that belief, like I can't have a successful business and a good relationship that might play out in your adulthood because of money is scarce. You'll go okay, well, my parents didn't spend time with me because they were in pursuit of money. And so if I make a lot of money, I'm not going to be able to have a successful business and be a good parent, or I'm not going to be able to have a successful business and have a great relationship. And so, you know, you start to pick those apart and go like, huh, is that true? Or this shows up a lot for entrepreneurs where they're not willing to invest in themselves or their businesses or buy anything for themselves and celebrate themselves when they're successful. So this one plays out where I see people, you know, entrepreneurs will make these huge leaps in their business, even, or let's say big or small growth, and they don't ever stop to celebrate themselves. They just keep going. It's like this constant version of stress and overwhelm because they're addicted to that feeling. And they just go like, well, there's never going to be enough. What if it goes away next week? I might not make that money. So I can't invest in my business or I can't buy that new thing that I want to buy, even though I have an abundance of money in the bank. So that is what a lot of people where the money is scarce shows up. They just feel this feeling of not enoughness. This is also where imposter syndrome comes in a lot. So mm. I'm not enough. Uh, what I create in the world is not enough. And so I've got to work hard to prove that I'm enough. And so it's a real scarcity money block. Yeah, that last part is really good because I think that that imposter syndrome affects so many people. And I think it even comes from the money, a bad money story, because if you're feeling like an imposter in something, it's probably because it's related somehow to accumulating, accumulating wealth or creating revenue or profit, whatever it happens to be. Um, but, you know, one of the questions I wrote down as you were talking about that with the second money block, be it money is scarce, is that. Why can't we think this about time? <laughs> I mean, think about the difference. If we moved our money story from money is scarce and time is whatever to yeah. time is scarce and money is like whatever, like I could get more money. And I teach this to my clients all the time because I'm kind of the exit guy. I'm the exit coach. So so I, I teach them, hey, leverage uh, money for time but yeah. most are leveraging time for money. And so we think that money is scarce and we spend all our time trying to get it when in reality, it's the flip. It's time is scarce and we should spend our money to get yeah. time, which is why I think what you're doing is so beneficial and valuable to the world is because you're helping entrepreneurs figure out that money thing so they get that time back. And that's, I yeah. love it. Yeah, I know you're the master delegation guy. I, I watched your TED talk. It was awesome. And I was just going like, I mean, absolutely. Realistically, time is the most precious commodity we have because Amen. we never get it back ever. You know, like every day you get a certain amount of time deposited into your account and you've got to spend it effectively and efficiently because you're never going to get it back, which is amazing to think about. I, I like that you just said that because we could also apply time to all of the money, block, all of the blocks, right? We could say people feel like time is bad. They're stressed out all the time. They think like time is the demon and that's why they can't get what they want 
right? My, uh, time is scarce or time causes stress. Like all of those things, it's very true. Time and money are very correlated in the way mm -hmm. that I work with people. And it's, here's the thing. If you believe time is scarce, you're probably going to be money scarce or let's say wealth scarce. You might have a lot of money, but you're not going to feel good about it because you're in a scarcity consciousness. You know, so anytime you hear yourself in a hurry or rushing, it means you have a scarcity block because you're thinking there's not enough time to do what I love to do. This will happen a lot as people age, they go like, oh my God, I'm running out of time to build my retirement fund. I'm running out of time to build a successful business. There's not enough time. I'm not patient. Like all of those things, those are versions of money blocks. Because if you have the thought that there's not enough a blank money, time, clients, people, resources, you have a money block of money is scarce or, it, yep. or there's scarcity happening in your reality. We have a question uh, that came in from a coach. So Wendy asks, I feel guilty charging more for my coaching services than I'm willing to pay for coaching services from other coaches. What reframe could I consider to eliminate the guilt? Oh, that's a juicy question, Wendy. I love it. Um, first, I would say a, an action reframe you could do is hire a coach who would, that's a stretch for you. Like pay more than you're, you are, pitch currently charging your people and that'll start to and, and don't just hit pay anyone find somebody who's aligned of course <laughs> and and this will start to loosen up that feeling around it so first i want to say guilt is one of the lowest frequencies we can experience right so guilt and shame are at the very bottom of the scale of consciousness and so anytime we're we're we have guilt we're projecting that onto the people that we attract our way and we're recreating the story of guilt and so one of the things you can do this is a really fun strategy is to eliminate your guilt is to start to write a benefits list. So, so, you know, get out a piece of paper now or later when this is over and write out and, and I want you to build it to 250, 250 benefits of your coaching services to your clients whatever it is in your area of expertise. And what this will do is starts to raise in your conscious awareness, the value that you bring, and it up levels your value in your mind of yourself. So guilt that you're charging too much can be in the money is bad or money is scarce money block. And when you have that scarcity, it's because unconsciously you are running a story that you don't think you have value. So it's imposter syndrome, right? Because if you believed that, if you truly knew that what you do brings high, high value, then the amount you charge would match, right? So an example would be, and this is a fun one to use with time. Like, let's say that you're financially free multi-billionaire. You would never spend one second of your day doing something you don't want to do because you could delegate it all out, right? Right. And most people don't think of it that way. And so they spend their time in a wasted way. Similarly, when you're working with clients who you don't charge enough, you're wasting your time in theirs because you're not going to get them as good of results because you are projecting your guilt onto them. And then you're attracting people who feel guilty. And so you want to start to play with, okay, let's raise the value of my coaching by me understanding the value I bring to them. And then in my conscious awareness, I go like, wow, I'm bringing a lot of value. And what I want you to think about is instead of charging for time, you're charging for results, right? And I always tell people, you're one thought away from millions of dollars. If I help you in a coaching session, have a thought that changes your reality to where you start to up-level your money story, it can make you millions of dollars. I've had it happen with people I've worked with, right? How, what, what is that worth? So you want to be thinking like, what is that? Um, what is that worth? How do I put a value on that transformation? And so that's a powerful reframe to start playing with. And, and let me know in the comments, Wendy, if that is helpful. So write a 250 benefits list to what your services do for your clients. And you'll, and, and you won't be able to do this in one sitting. Like it'll take you a while. I, I put it on my desktop. And I just keep adding to it. And every time I raise my prices, I do this list again. I go like, okay, what are the benefits now? What are the benefits now? And I do the primary, secondary, and tertiary. And I start to play in my mind with what is all the value that I'm bringing to them. And then when I look at that list and I get on a consult, it's like, hey, I I'm bringing you potentially millions of dollars. So I don't feel afraid to charge what I'm worth. So that makes, you know, let us know if that makes sense, Wendy. Great, great answer. Great answer. And I know that, uh, I, you know, I'm a coach and you're a coach. I mean, we got lots of coaches on here and 
this setting of pricing is something every coach goes through at the beginning. Like, what do I charge? How do I do this? And you just, you're pulling a number out of your rear end or out of the air, however you want to say it. You're just pulling a number out and deciding that's what I'm going to charge. But the reality is you got to charge for the value or as you said, charge for the results. What are they getting? So, yeah. you know, if you're getting tremendous value, that's going to improve their life in a, in a, in a great way, then charge a requisite to that amount. If, if what you're doing is helping just move the needle a tiny little bit, we'll charge a tiny little amount. It doesn't matter what anybody else is charging. It doesn't matter what, what might be perceived as your ability or your, your mind as their ability to pay. It's, yeah. Listen, I when I started my mastermind, the price point that I put the mastermind at, I honestly had this money block going, nobody's ever going to pay that. And then sure enough, somebody wrote a check and they joined and then the next person, and then the next person, and the next person and more and more. And it's it was so much more money than I thought that I could get away with. But but I'm adding that value that that and, and now that I add up the value, I'm probably undercharging for what we're what I'm doing for everybody, what they're getting. So anyway, yeah. uh Wendy, Wendy says, um, she goes on to say, if I raise prices, I feel like I won't get clients. So how do you deal with that? Oh, oh, oh. Like another money oh, I, block. I missed that. Okay. <laughs> I, if I raise, but yeah, yeah, this is a fear you'll have for sure. So the first thing you want to do is start up leveling your prices every quarter by 10%. You know, just start with a 10% stretch. I promise you that your clients won't even notice, like they won't even flinch. If you're truly bringing value and, and let's start there. Like if you're truly bringing value, when you do a 10% increase every quarter, no one says anything. I'll, and I'll tell you this, I've, I've done this with so many people and it's been the coolest thing to see where they have the exact same fears. They're like, oh my God, what if people leave? Or what if no one pays for it? And, and, and they get freaked out and then they do it anyway, because they're like, okay, I'm going to be NFA about it. I'm going to practice it. And, and they get more clients, higher level clients, and the clients that they already have never leave and they pay it and they go like, they, they even often will have clients say, I was waiting for you to charge more because you're not charging enough. And so you, you, it, it's, it's you up leveling and then you reflect to them who they are paying you to be. They're buying your confidence. So when you feel guilty, you're not confident. And that's hard to get clients when you feel guilty because that's not an attractive frequency right? Like under the law of attraction, you want to be attracting what you're being. And so being confident going like, Hey, I know I bring value and trusting it and playing with it. And just like Jason just said, that first one, he thought like, is anyone going to pay this? And then you get the first one and you're like, Holy moly. I had this, the first person I ever sold a program to, it was, I charged a lot. And I was like, I, like you said, I just kind of pulled it out of my rear end and I was like, I don't know, I'm just going to charge this amount. And I had this really powerful conversation with her. And at the end, she asked, I said it, she didn't even flinch. And then at the end of the conversation, she said, you need to double your rates. And I was like, really? So I went home and I had a coffee like shop consult the next day. And I, all night I was like, am I really going to double my rates? So we were talking like, it was a lot and I didn't have any experience yet, you know? And I was like, and so I'm in the conversation with this guy the next day and we're having a super powerful conversation. He's having breakthroughs in the moment and on the spot, because I didn't have anything typed or written or website or anything. I just like said the price and he didn't flinch and he paid it. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it blew my mind. And the reason is because he was buying my confidence. I knew I could help him. I gave him the experience of helping him. And to him, that was valuable, right? And so Wendy, don't be afraid bring awesome value and just start raising your prices by 10% because your brain won't freak out over 10. Doubling might freak you out. If it doesn't go for it and see what happens. Play uh, so, with it. so I love, you said buying confidence. I think that's a really important thing because think about it this way as an analogy. So if you had had some sort of, um, uh, of a mixture, a drink mixture that you know is good for you and you are trying to sell this and you go to someone and you're like, Hey, this is great for you. You should drink this. And about the moment they pull it up to their lips, you kind of go, Ugh! you know, like your face is like, is this going to work or not? <laughs> like when you do that, they're not going to drink it because they look at you and they're reading your body language. Like she said, this was good for me, but uh, her face is telling me that it ain't good for me. So no, I'm not going to drink it. The same thing we offer any service, not just coaching service. It could be, you could be selling shoes and you say, Hey, these shoes are $582. And if you're face also agrees with that the verbs the words coming out of your mouth then they're gonna they're gonna be like okay they're worth 582 dollars but if you if you they're 582 dollars like if you if your face yeah. is going no nah, this is not right it's so with coaching services the same thing and I, I will say this and then we'll move on to the third money block i remember back in the day 
when I first started my, the, my, my lighting company, that I still own when our projects were six figures to seven figure projects, they were very expensive projects. I remember the first time pitching a six figure project to someone and going like turning that number around, sliding across the desk, it scared to death that they were going to lose their mind and run away screaming or throw stuff at me because of the, I'm not used to spending that much money. And I'm, I didn't think they were now I could pitch a hundred thousand dollar deal, a million dollar deal, whatever it is. Don't even think about it because you stretch your ability yes. and it doesn't matter. You're going back to the neuroplasticity and that, you know, this, our brain stretch to the reality that we build. And so if we, if a hundred grand is not a lot to us and we go say, yeah, my coach is a hundred grand. We don't even, we don't even flinch. And if the person says, oh my gosh, you don't react the same way. You're like, well, you're the one, you don't think this is worth it. That'd be like me saying this Ferrari is $400,000 and you're going, oh, I can't believe it's more than 20 grand. Well, you obviously are not dealing with reality. Like th that's the way we've got to get our brains yeah. to. And I love yeah. this mindset stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, this is so fun. And, you know, I want Wendy and everyone else here to think about what is something that you used to charge a smaller amount for and, and you've already up leveled it and you now see the stretch zone in your brain where you go like, oh, it does. It makes sense to charge this much now. It, so it it's important to keep stretching yourself in the way that you think about money because you've got to change your money set point. And so if you keep thinking I'm a thousand dollar coach versus a hundred thousand dollar coach versus a million dollar coach, we want to get you up leveling, up leveling, up leveling. And so it just takes these little strategic bumps in your mind to start playing with what would it feel like to double my rates and just, and play with it, like do it on one console and just see what happens, right? Like play with it. Because Wendy, if you, you don't do it. do it, it's the scarcity mindset. You're like, oh, there's not enough. What, what if they go away? So just play with it. Yeah, try it, Wendy. I, I would love to hear how it goes. It's you really do fun. It. To I know, do. Wendy. Wendy, you got this. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Get it yeah. in your brain that you're worth more than what you're charging now. You're going to be all right. So let's talk about the third, the third uh, money block. We got money is bad. Money is scarce. And then the third is money causes stress. And I bet you everybody here has experienced stress at some point, <laughs> And it's probably related to money. So yes. uh, what do you, what's this one about? Yeah, definitely. And, and real quick. Uh, so for the, we had some comments come in, uh, great idea. So I think that was for the benefits list. Yes, that um, is a good one. And then they love the demonstration over the drink. Awesome. Yeah. Denise says that it's so true. And then the 10% up level strategy. Yeah. So just start up leveling yourself by 10%. And it's that stretch. Similarly with when you start a savings and investment, do the same thing every, every quarter and up level it by 10%. And your brain doesn't notice the, the, deficit in your bank account of the 10%. So you just do auto on 10% up level every quarter. And then you'll notice it starts accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. You do the same thing with your money mindset. So any 10% stretch doesn't freak you out to the point where your inner being and that imposter syndrome way just goes like, oh, you're full of crap. There's no way that you could charge this much. <laughs> Okay. So money causes stress. I, so I have a money blocks profile quiz. If anyone wants to take it moneyblocksprofile.com with it's pluralized. So moneyblocksprofile.com. And in that quiz, um, I have like the stats of everyone who's taken it. And the number one money block for entrepreneurs is money causes stress uh, by far. Um, you know, it's about, it's a little, it's about equal between money is scarce and money, uh, money is bad. Money causes stress, number one by far. And, you know, I think part of that has to do with that entrepreneurship attracts a certain type of person <laughs> who is in some ways addicted to stress. And so that's why I like to help people learn how to reprogram their money mindset to where they can live by what you and I both love, you know, work less, make more, have fun. And I love when I met you and I looked on your website, I'm like, what? You have work less, make more on your website. And that's like my main NFA money mantra is work less, make more, have fun. And that have fun part is this part we're talking about letting go of the stress, learning how to live in your zone of genius so that you can step into what I like to think of as your zone of manifestation where easier money making can happen. So if everyone here thinks about doing something they absolutely love to do and making money doing it, that is your greatest potential to make the most money in the easiest way because you have this magnetic force attracting opportunities your way when you're aligned in a place of flow. Stress is the opposite of flow right? And so money causes stress is one of those things where it's going to be, you know, you're someone addicted 
addicted to the feeling of stress and you don't really know how to relax and you think that you got to work hard to make money. So number one belief here is I've got to work hard to make money. And most likely this happened from when you were a kid watching your parents work really hard being told if we think about the conditioning in school, even right. It's like work hard, get good grades, get a good job so that someday you can retire and do what you want to do. That's like, what everyone teaches us, <laughs> right? Like yep. it's such a backward story. And so, you know, this one, I want people to start reframing toward how do I get paid to do what I love and enjoy the process? How do I allow opportunities to come my way instead of forcing in fear and doubt and uncertainty? How do I start to get up every day and do things that are more aligned with delegation? So I always teach people, you've got to drop, automate, or delegate away the things that aren't bringing you joy so that you can make easier money. If you have this money block, the problem here is that if you're unconscious of it, you're going to keep recreating situations where you have to work hard to make money to reinforce the belief that you have to make money. And the way this works is that your RAS, your reticular activating system, tracks your surroundings to prove what you believe to be true. So you will always find evidence for what you believe. Always. Because it's easy to do, right? And everyone here, this is a fun experiment to do. Everyone here, look in, in your room where you're sitting, if you can. If you're, well, I guess if you're if they're on Zoom live right now, they're not watching, they're not driving. But if you're driving, don't do this. <laughs> but if you're sitting somewhere where you can do it, I want you to look around your room, track for everything that's red, and and keep an account like you, you're going to tell me when you come back everything that's red. So look around the room, what's red, take note of it, pay attention to it, you know. Okay, get at least, you know, five things that you can see. Okay, now come back and tell me everything that's green without looking. You don't know because you were looking for everything that's red, <laughs> right? Yes. And this is how our brain is wired. So if you're looking for the, if you're unconsciously or consciously believing that money is scared, money causes stress, you're going to be recreating the belief that I got to work hard to make money. And you're only going to find opportunities where money making is hard. And so you've got to start retraining your brain in a different way. That reticular activating system, that that's a really good point. To, I don't know if everybody's heard about this before. Or you call it the RAS, reticular activating system, is part of our brain that causes us to recognize things that are on our consciousness or that we thought about before. So, for instance, the, the best way to think about it is if you just bought a new car and you, let's say you bought a, a Toyota Camry, you are going to now see Toyota Camrys everywhere because it's in your brain your particular activating system is going to reinforce that that's why mind work like what you're doing amanda with with money stuff is so so important because if we start thinking better about money get rid of these money blocks our reticular activating system can be our friend. It'll start, that, hey, money's easy to make. Money doesn't cause stress. Money is good. I love money. Money loves me. And there's plenty of it. And I can go get more. If we start thinking about that, our reticular activating system will, will kick in and let us see those opportunities. And that's why I love that you mentioned that. Yeah, it, it's it's wild. When you pay attention to it, you're like, whoa. And, and this is why reframes are so powerful, right? So NFA money formula is three steps. And I teach this to everyone. It's the core foundation of everything I do in my courses, in my one-on-one, -on -one, and, in a, and I train people these simple steps. So recognize is number one of the three-step NFA money formula. You've got to recognize, and, and we can break this down, recognize, reframe, repeat to reprogram. So one, recognize, two, reframe, three, repeat to reprogram. And the reason that this is so important is because there's only two ways to reprogram your subconscious mind. It's either through repetition or hypnosis. And hypnosis could be states like meditation and things like that. So it's actually pretty easy to start to reprogram your subconscious mind when you go like, okay, wait, first I've got to recognize what is it that I believe. Then we reframe it and we repeat, 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 repeat. And then all of a sudden you'll notice, let's say 30 days. I, I've had this experience so many times. I'll give an example where, you know, I'll be going along doing something and something happens that maybe would have happened to me a year ago. And all of a sudden I have a completely different response. Like I'm like, and then I notice I'm like, oh my God, I didn't respond the way I used to respond. It's because I've reprogrammed my money mindset. So I don't have the same reaction anymore. Now I have a totally new me because I've trained my brain in a different direction through doing this exact process. And so the way to start doing that, when you're recognizing it's doing things like the money story, it's you asking yourself on a regular basis, like, what do I believe about money? 
Uh, you know, like Wendy going, I feel guilty. That's you recognizing you feel guilty. That's important to recognize. And now you ask the perfect question, what reframe? So you want to start recognizing your money beliefs. You want to reframe them in the, and, and this is reframe strategies that are mindset based and action based. So you want to take you want to change your mindset, which then causes you to get into inspired action in a new way. And you repeat, repeat, repeat. And this reprograms your money mindset over time. And it's your success is inevitable. If you practice what I'm teaching, <laughs> it's, it's impossible for you not to succeed. So this is a good time then for us to talk about as people are watching this or listening to this and they say, you know what? I need help reprogramming this. I need the help with the reframe. I need help with the repeating because I need the accountability to make me do this the right way. So how would they how would they reach out and get in touch with you? Is there a specific way that you would recommend? Yeah. So what I would do is I would go to my latest program. And this is like everything we've talked about today is embedded in this program. It's 12 weeks. They can work either in group. I like to have different price points for people because I know everyone's at different levels. So they can either work in it, like it's a course I walk through where they have access to me on an app or they can do one on one. Obviously, we know the benefits and drawbacks of each of those. They're different, different course, it's same course, but with me having full time or in an app. So if they go to reprogram your money mindset now.com. So reprogram your money mindset now.com. What that does is it walks them through 12 weeks of, I give them my top 12 NFA money methods. One of them is they're rewriting their money story. We've got all kinds of awesome strategies and there's things that I've taught, I've done on myself and taught all the people that I work with and just played with over the years of my business and going, okay, what's the fastest, quickest way to reprogram our money mindset so we can scale our business from our zone of manifestation and in our zone of genius. And, you know, for me, all the work I do is helping people refine, you know, you and I jive so well, Jason, because it's like a lot of that is going to be about delegation. Like you've got to delegate if you want to live in your zone of genius, because a lot of people, most people, especially with the money causes stress block, they will be living in what Gay Hendricks the, is the person who coined the term zone of genius. He talks about the zone of excellence. So most people live in their zone of excellence where they are really good at a lot of things. And a lot of entrepreneurs are really good at a lot of things because we're go-getters. We're, we're thinking about solutions. We're coming up with a whole bunch of different ways to do things. And so when you live in your zone of excellence, you don't break through to that next level in your zone of genius where you get to really feel good. And the only way to do that is to start to learn how to know what you love doing and start to drop, automate, or delegate away the things that you don't love doing. And it's a scary thing for people. Like, let's say you have the money, money causes stress and money is scarce money block operating at the same time. You're going to work really hard. You're going to overdo it. You're going to have some imposter syndrome because you're going to think, you know, like I got to prove myself. And then you're not going to want to delegate because again, you are, think money is scarce. So you're afraid to spend the money on delegation. And so you just keep working and working and working on the treadmill. I call it the treadmill of BS. Like you're running and running and running and running. And you know, you're getting exercise and you might be able to build a six figure business. You could even build a seven figure business in this state, but you're not going to feel good when you get there. Mm -hmm. And that is not the goal. Like we don't want to create prisons out of our businesses. Um, oh, one of my favorite quotes is you can't escape a prison if you don't know that you're in one. I love that quote, right? And that's what a lot of entrepreneurs do. And so this reprogram your money mindset course is all about helping people reconstruct their thinking, reprogram their mindset, learn strategies to scale their business. And then, you know, in the one-on-one -on -one version, they get like a full on business scaling plan with me. And we walk through how to double their income in 12 weeks. If, and the doubling, you know, obviously I work with certain people and I, if you're, it depends on where you're at, how we do that. Yeah. So we're talking with Dr. Amanda Barrientes today about the top three money blocks that are keeping you and preventing you from making money. And those are money is bad, money is scarce and money causes stress. And so if you are dealing with any of these, which uh, you, most of you are, most of us or at some point in our lives, go to reprogramyourmoneymindsetnow.com. That's reprogramyourmoneymindsetnow.com. And you can do that. Now, if you want to take that money block profile that we talked about earlier, you can go to moneyblocksprofile.com, moneyblocksprofile.com. And uh, I would encourage you uh, to work with, uh, with Dr. Amanda because she's got this figured out. She's gone from that place of crying, not knowing where money's coming from, to figuring it out, dedicating herself to figuring this out so that you can 
figuring it out as well. Now, I want to go back to, if we can, before we finish up today, the question about debt that was asked really early on in, oh, our, yes. in our thing. So the, the mm -hmm. question, if I scroll up to that, it was something about... Um, good and bad debt. Yeah, give a description between good and bad debt. Yeah, and I'm glad because I said I was going to interweave it in, and then I didn't, so thanks for the reminder. Um, <laughs> well, first, let's say good and bad and debt, those words charged all the way around, right? I think a lot of people think of debt as really bad, quote unquote, bad, and they work to eliminate it. The interesting thing that happens when, when people have that belief is that what they will do is it's, they end up living by be, do, have instead of, or sorry, have, do, be instead of be, do, have. So what they think is like, once I get out of debt, I'll start saving and investing. And then they never get out of debt. So they never start saving investing. So I think reframing your thoughts around debt is really important to where we look at what is the difference between good and bad debt. I, I personally would say bad debt is when you're frivolously spending money, not on your highest values, and you're doing it as a way to escape and avoid something. Most people who build up a lot of debt for, you know, let, let's say frivolous, silly reasons, uh, you know, let's say going and buying a, a six TVs that you don't need, something along those lines, we're just going to use that as an example, that to me is a version of bad debt. You know, you don't want to pay, be buying things that you can't afford and that you don't have them. And that's, I don't like to use those words either. Uh, you don't want to be buying things that are not going to be creating assets for you in the future, assets for you in the future. Okay. Good debt would be investment in yourself where you know you're going to get an ROI return from that investment at some point in the near future. And so that's the way I like to think about, you know, good and bad debt. I'm sure you have something to say here as well. Um, so some of it's a mindset switch around it, around it. And it's really looking at your habits and your belief system around money. Most people who accumulate a lot of stressful debt, it's because they're spending money on fulfilling a void. So they'll, they don't feel good in their life. They don't feel good in their business. They think that they need to be ca catching up, keeping up with the Joneses, like that kind of thing. And they accumulate debt and they don't consider consciously, is this money going to appreciate in the future to where I can, you know, pay the debt off with money earned from the money that I borrowed. That's the way that I like to think about it. Yeah, I think that's a good perspective. And I, I would I would tack on to that to say that if it if it makes you money, it doesn't cost you money. So yeah. that's kind of the way you're going to think about it is if you if you borrow someone else's, you borrow one hundred thousand dollars from me, I give you that hundred thousand dollars and then you are able to make more than what that debt service costs. Yeah. That's no, that's good. That is a yeah. that is a leverage position that makes you money and it doesn't cost you anything. But if you're if you borrow the hundred thousand and you go buy a new truck, you know the new F one fifty Lightning, you know which is a hundred thousand dollar electric truck. Okay, is that making you money? Probably not. Uh, so that actually costs you money. So that's bad debt. So the way I look at it is, if it makes you money, it doesn't cost you anything. If it's not making you money, it costs you everything. You got to be very very careful. And the problem with debt is that we've got other money coaches that have been out there telling us that we should never ever yeah. have debt. And yeah. they're just, they're just wrong. That's, that's a message that is way too simplistic for everyone to, to, to take all the, all at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, well and this then, is, you know, like I said, in that one, it's like, be careful to not get stuck in that thing of like, Oh, once I pay off my debt, then I'll start saving and investing because you got to start developing the habit of saving and investing and always, you know, and no matter whether you have, and, and, and you know, I like to reframe the word debt even where I just, it, it's like, I don't think of it as debt because I exactly I go, Oh, someone's investing in me so I can make more money. Yeah. Well, when you we know? think about debt, like I'm, I don't have any consumer debt. I don't, I don't have any mortgage debt. I'm not, I'm out of debt, yeah. but then I got to go, well, I have business debt, which is leverage. Yeah. So I've borrowed money to invest in coaches. Like I literally, I had to, I borrowed money two years ago that I didn't have at that moment to hire a coach that I needed yeah. to get to that level. So, so I'm still paying that off, but I've made a lot more money because of what I invested through yeah. debt that got me to where I am today. So yeah, I have business debt. I've, I'm leveraging thing, lever leveraging that money to get the things that I need to get to the place where I need to go. So I, I, I truly believe that borrowing money, depending on what you're borrowing it for is okay. You just got to be very, very careful. With yeah. It. 
again, it's consciousness, right? It's like being conscious of, you're not reacting impulsively and in a way that's fulfilling some sort of addictive need to feel better. That's a reaction. We want to be responding consciously and going, hey, is this money going to make money for me, right? Um, Ryan says, no debt, no good debt, that is. No good debt keeps the middle, uh, yeah, keeps, like, our construct around debt is what keeps people impoverished, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like, wealthy people leverage money. Yeah, well. I've never met a super mega wealthy person who's not leveraging their money in smart ways. Yeah, you've got, uh, I mean, Robert Kiyosaki, who's probably one of the more more famous guys who've written books about money, talks about that he 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 doesn't pay taxes because he borrows every dollar to do what he's doing. Yeah. And, and so he's making money off other people's money. Debt is something you have to do. And he and he and Dave Ramsey go round and round about that because Dave Ramsey said, don't borrow debt, don't borrow money. But I don't know this to be true, but I'm pretty sure Dave's leveraging something somewhere. I, it's got, there's no way. <laughs> yeah. There's no way. Well, go right. to, uh, so go to reprogram your money mindset now.com. We've dropped the link. Dr. Amanda just dropped the link in the chat. So if you're here live in the chat, go click on those two links. There's a link reprogram your money mindset now.com and then money blocks profile.com engage, engage with her Let her. Uh, tell her, tell her when you talk to her and say, Hey, I heard you on the EMS and uh, I was really impressed as you should be. Uh, I was really impressed with the, your, your perspective on that. So check her out, go follow NFA money for no effing around. So YouTube, she's yeah. got lots of videos that come out. She's got a great email list, join her email list. Amanda, this has been, this has been fantastic. Are there any final words that you want to get advice about money blocks and how we can make more uh. money? I, I could do this all day with you. I love it so much. Thanks for having me on. The, the last thing I'll say, and I, I always like to close with inspiration. And I like to remind people of this. Like if you write this down and you live by this, life will be awesome and you'll make money over time. Um, always remember your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. So if you don't like what's going on on the outside, meaning the amount of money you have, you got to start changing what's within, meaning your mindset, your energy, and that will change your habits, right? So, so all, you have so much power. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> and, and you are probably playing small no matter what level you're playing at because you have unconscious money blocks. And most entrepreneurs don't know that they have them. They don't know that it's the reason that they're stuck. And I, it's so fun to work with someone. It's like the puzzle of the mind and picking it apart and going like, oh, this one little tweak of your unconscious belief makes you millions of dollars. Like everyone needs to do this work. Agreed 100%, which is why I wanted to bring this to all of the audience out there at Entrepreneur Master Series. This is the type of quality stuff that you're going to get on a regular basis. So make sure that you go register. I'm going to share on the, I'm going to share on the screen right now just a uh, an image for those of you that are here live. Thank you guys for attending this episode of the Entrepreneur Master Series. We've had Dr. Amanda Barrientes with No F and Around Money, NFA Money. Go check her out on YouTube. Go look her up on all the socials. Uh, this is a free service to the worldwide family for the TRJD family. Anybody that's part of my coaching family, or if you're on the outskirts looking in and you haven't yet joined the family officially yet, this is still free value that I offer twice a month. So thank you guys for joining in. And if you want to go check us out next time, we're doing this again in a couple of weeks, go to the real slash EMS, and you can register for the next one. We're going to be talking about some really cool stuff on the next episode of the entrepreneur master series. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for listening on the podcast later, wherever you're listening to this. Thank you so much. And Dr. Amanda, such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Once again, this has been a blast. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me on. Bye everyone. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Follow Jason on social media at The Real Jason Duncan. Are you an entrepreneur who feels trapped in the weeds of daily operations, not experiencing the freedom you thought you'd have as a business owner? Want to know the way out? Take Jason's free exit readiness assessment to see how close you are to getting ready to experience true freedom and success as an entrepreneur. 
Go to amireadytoexit.com today. That's amireadytoexit.com. See you again next time here on The Root of All Success.